Hi, this is Greg Weissman, the voice of Lucas Carr, and you're listening to Whelm, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Taylor N, D, 5, 1. Hello team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome Taylor Montgomery. Taylor graduated from the University of Maryland with a degree in criminology and criminal justice. And outside of that great accomplishment, she's also an avid Young Justice fan on social media. And even more recently, she's also become a Young Justice fan fiction writer as well. So Taylor, welcome to Whelmed. Hi, everyone. So before we begin and get into everything we're going to be talking about today, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including episodes 1 through 16 of season 3, the comics and the video game. So if you have not seen, read, or played all the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. So I touched on a few things in the intro, but uh, could you tell us a little more about who you are and what you do, Taylor? Well, um, I graduated from University of Maryland back in 2017, so technically recent, but not too, too recent. I had a criminology and criminal justice major, Bachelor of Arts, and interesting fact, I that wasn't my first choice. I was actually undecided. I had to like jump around, take different classes. It happens. It happens. I, I tried a computer science class. <laughs> hard no <laughs> interesting fact I wanted to be like a nurse or pharmacist at first all throughout high school because my auntie Dee was a ph- uh, my aunt Dee Dee was a pharmacist and throughout high school I realized I just don't like science <laughs> I took um, an astronomy class as an elective not an elective as a, a gen ed you had to take yeah for, for school thinking it would be easy but I nearly I, I it was hard I was like, why? I just need to get a C. I'll be okay. I just need to get a C. I'll get the credits. I'll still get the credits for a C. So you mentioned that you don't like science, but I I have no idea what criminology actually is. Mm-hmm. Like, what what is your major? Like, sorry to be that person, but what exactly oh, is your major? <laughs> so I'll try to explain it the best I can. But basically, criminology and criminal justice, you learn things about like our justice system. You take different classes. Like, cool. I took a class on policing juvenile delinquency, about gangs, like gangs throughout the country, like the Bloods, Crips, and local gangs around in, in Maryland. And I would say the most interesting class I probably took was the policing and juvenile delinquency class, and even the gangs one too, because one, the teacher I had was fantastic. She made the class fun, fun to learn about. And it was just interesting, like you learn, well, actually no, the policing class was a different one, but like the policing class, <laughs> but she was a good teacher too. In the policing, you learn how basically it is to be a police officer, like how they think during, t- during different situations. I even did like a ride along. Interesting. Which was, which was really cool. I want to do it at night because things can happen more around our school at nighttime because now kids can, kids can get a little bit crazy at night. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because like, you know, how things can happen, things are going on, with, how things are going on with the police now. You kind of learn how it, how it's, is on their end. So that was interesting. And Joe about delinquency was interesting too, because you learned about what's like the process for juvenile delinquency for juveniles once they're in the system and how yeah. they want to, how they could be possibly be rehabilitated back into society. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like a, uh, like a social science type of thing, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it was, yeah, yeah that made us all under the social science department. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, so moving o- a little bit away from that, when did you first see Young Justice? Like, w- did you watch it on DVD, on Netflix? Did you watch it when it was back on Cartoon Network? I watched it when it was back on Cartoon Network. I am an oldie. Same. So <laughs> interesting fact. So I believe the first two episodes was like an hour, they did an hour long special back in November. Yeah. Or they re- released the rest, rest of the series. So I didn't watch it when it first aired back in November. I believe I was, I had the same treatment as Toll Drama where I was like, hey, I'm not she didn't do it, I'm not going to watch it. But then episode three came on and I watched it. <laughs> I was hooked. I watched episode one and two. I was hooked since then. 
and I then it had me grabbing my chest every week. And then when the, the unexpected hiatus has happened, I was like, "What is this? When is the show coming back?" Like those those hiatuses were so unexpected. We were just like, yeah. "Okay." I I very distinctly remember all of the hiatuses back in the day. I was very much in the same boat as you of just kind of jumping in and being like, so this is wonderful. And why does it keep disappearing? Yeah. And then when season and then season one finale aired and the next week, season two, first episode happened. And then I still remember our reaction when I found out Lagan and McGann were dating. I literally, <laughs> I was sitting on something. When I saw them kiss, I hopped off my seat. I walked around it, screamed what, like two times and sat back down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah very very similar situation in my house that saturday morning i was like what is happening what what this is not this is not okay but uh that just makes me curious so you watched it during the original run but like what was your history with dc or just comics in general before watching the show like did you were you interested in comics before watching the show um not really so i never really read the comics the only time i kind of read it but not really so you know, you know the original Teen Titans cartoon that they, that needs to come back from season six. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do remember the original Teen Titans so, cartoon. They had a, t- a tie-in comic like that happened kind of like not in but not during the show, but it's like yeah, well, it kind of is during the during the show, like Teen Titans Go, not the one that's in now, but like they had Teen, the Teen Titans Go tie-in comic. Right. I kind of read that. I, I was trying to find like little comic volumes, like the one where these alien, the Gordanians were kind of were kid. I think. I believe it was the Gordanians. They were kidnapping the Titans girls, and that's where Do- Wonder Girl, Donna Troy version, was used yeah. because they couldn't use Donna Troy in the actual show. They had her picture on, like, when they were calling all Titans, when they were calling all the Titans in season five. Yeah. But they could use it, but they use her in the comics. So I kind of, like, try. I remember, like, scourging the internet to find those, but that particular volume, but other than that, not really. And then but, but back when Young Justice was on Arts Network, I still didn't really read the Young Justice Time comic, but I knew of them but now yeah. thanks to dc universe i have starting to read them more with the season three one yeah it came out before season four part one of, of season three yeah. came on i read that one fully then i started reading some of the ones that are already released fully like how armors how armors came onto the, onto the team yeah and, yeah that's a really good one yeah and then i kind of read the story when they went camping how the stories of miss martian robin and kid flash and that and then i started reading the first run of the Blue Beetle comics it made me love Jaime even more because season two, I already love him for season two. Those comics made me love him more. And that's how I said I started um, shipping Blue 13, Blue Beetle in season 13. Yes, yes. Which actually leads me perfectly into what we were planning to talk about next. So when we were initially planning this whole discussion episode, uh, one of the things you mentioned that you really wanted to talk about was Tracy 13, who, for people who only watch the show, is a completely new character in season three that we've never seen before. Uh, and I don't know much about her beyond what we've seen of her in Outsiders this season. And we just got more of her this past week with episode 16 and all of that. Uh, but favorite episode, favorite episode. <laughs> it's really good. I really love that one. Uh, but you said she's actually one of like your favorite characters. So t- tell me about her. Tell me about her, like who she is in the comics jumps out at you about Tracy as a character and draws you to her. So granted, I didn't know much about her either before <laughs> season three. <laughs> and then it's like, I started really learning about her when I started reading Blue Beetle comics and then yeah. the show. So I'll try to give a mini comic book history because from the Tumblr post and video YouTube videos I've seen. So um, she is of a race called Homo Magi, which is where people who are born with powerful connections to magic yeah. And in one of the videos, I actually learned that apparently Zatanna's mother is that's of that species. So she has her father who has that magic, who uses magic, and then her mother is Homai magic. Homo magic user, so that's why she's probably so powerful. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's her whole backstory in the comics. Yeah. And um, here are all the issues, the issues that you can start for reading her if you want to know of. She's in Adventures of Superman, issue 611. Superman, the Man of Steel, issue 133. Action Comics issue 798. Action Comics <laughs> 801 and 806 through 808. Day of Vengeance Infinite, Infinite Crisis Special. Doctor 13 Agriculture. Or no. Doctor 13 
architecture and morality, which is, which is like part of the Tales of the Unexpected comic. So it's like you have Tales of the Unexpected, then you've got the Doctor Thirteen at the at the second as the second yeah. comic. I started reading that last night, but I fell asleep during the third part, so I got to change it <laughs> sometime this weekend. And then in the Blue Beetle, in the first Blue Beetle run, volumes. Eight and then issues 13, 16, 19, 21, 24 through 28, 35, <laughs> and 36. Booster Gold, Volume 2, issues 28 and 29. I read those. those are, that was a cute one. The DC 2008 Holiday Special, The Teen Titans. I read that one. That was cute, too. <laughs> In Teen Titans, Volume 3, issues 66, 67, 72 to 74, 83 through 87. And Batman slash Batman, wait, Lord, um, Superman slash Batman. <laughs> Issues thirty, issues eighty three through eighty four. He's also in Flashpoint, the world of Flashpoint. Issues one through three, but uh, but those are so those are the issues that she's in. Yeah, she, yeah. She in but what about team. her as character? Like draws you to her? Well, from what I read, from what I've read in the comics, she seems like a very goofy person. <laughs> like, yeah, take that. <laughs> yeah, that's how that's how she's like a blue beetle, blue beetle comics, and then. She kind of has that same personality in the show. Yeah. yeah. Like that, that, like I believe Rich said that one when you're in the episodes, how Comic Con, they have these little character, little descriptions, how she, she says with the character on the show, everything amazes her. She's cute, snarky, she has a sense of wonder, and she's easy to get along with. And in fact, about her in the comics, she was banned from using magic from her father, who was Dr. 13. Oh. Because her mother, her mother actually died from as a result of magical influence, but of course she didn't stop using it. And she, her powers basically revolved on urban magic, which is like this, which is basically city magic, and she taps into the powers of the city, to like the knowledge of powers of cities. That's where her powers come from. And depending on what city she's in, depends on what power she has, which can revolve around casting spells, teleporting, creating force fields, making blasts of fire, and she can transform her. Pe- she can transform her pet iguana into a dragon. <laughs> a power <laughs> she, we would all like to have. Yeah, and she has apparently she and she has a pet iguana that she has a telepathic connection to. So she's kind of similar to Jaime in the Scarab in that sense. <laughs> but that's really interesting. So her powers in the comics are kind of different from how they are on the show, right? Because yeah, the show is yeah. given her like bad luck magic. Yeah, think, like Jinx, like Jinx, like, yeah, like Jinx yeah. from. Teen Titans. So, like, I remember looking through the archives of Axe Greg, and, she, and he somebody asked a question about Thirteen, and he said, "Well, Tracy Thurston is their spin of, of the Tracy Thirteen character with their own, and, with, and they basically gave her like bad luck type power. So, but she's still learning to control from Episode Five. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm assuming based on what we've talked about that you're enjoying the way she's being portrayed on Young Justice. Yeah, yeah. Yes, she's so cute and adorable. I need to see more of her. <laughs> like, she, we saw a little bit of her episode five. I saw her episode one. She didn't speak at all. Then we saw more of her episode five. She was fangirling over Gar, Gar's new show. And then when she, she, she's like, I can't believe we're going to it. I'm not a planet. This is so cool. She actually, like, her magic, she lost control of her magic and she got excited. Yes. And then she, that was actually very useful too for episode five. Like, she kind of she used her bad luck magic to like get the met, those med teams off those little um firepower machines. Yep. The ground, and then we saw more of her in episode sixteen, which made me love her more. <laughs> she really is wonderful in episode sixteen. Yeah. Oh my god. I wouldn't wonder how many times she <laughs> elbows Jaime because she she elbows him like three times, and then like I knew she would. She fangirled over Gar for meeting him. <laughs> And then you can tell, I think really her and Hobby are really good match for each other because like, she is so unfazed by the scare. <laughs> She's like, oh, he wanted to blow it up, didn't he? Well, like if you're gonna, if you're gonna be in a relationship with a superhero, you gotta at least kind of understand each other's powers. You gotta be at least somewhat chill with that. <laughs> yeah. And then when she brought down the hell, when she brought down the helicopter, the powers, the look that Jaime gave her, I was like, oh my God, he likes her so much. <laughs> Yeah, because yes. so she was in a relationship with him pre um, New Fifty Two, but in the Rebirth comic, she was actually in a relationship with Natasha Irons, who was a daughter of Steel. But apparently, they broke up. So people, 
before the season, the season premiere, people were wondering if she's going to be one of the LGBT characters or in a relationship with Jaime. So, and I was hoping, of course, I was hoping that she was going to be in a relationship with Jaime because I, how I read the Blue Beetle comic, I'm like, oh, yay! But she, she could be both. She could yeah. be bi and still yeah. dating Jaime. We don't know. We'll see. Yeah, we'll we got, see. We still got half a season left. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But us, but since we're starting to get onto the topic of relationships, aside from your love for Tracy, we also talked a bit uh, when planning this about your interest in discussing the role that like support systems play in the team dynamics and like the character relationships on Young Justice. So I also wanted to dive into that for a little bit, if you're okay with moving away from Tracy mm-hmm. 13 for a bit. I'm sure she will come up more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so first, uh, let's maybe define what you mean by support systems. So like when we were talking about it, is it, do you just mean like friendships in a big ensemble cast the way Young Justice has, or is it something more complicated or more specific than that? Well, it's less of like friendships in the ensemble cast of Young Justice, but it's also in the sense that how those friendships, they're friends, but they're like family as well. Yes. I think I saw a Tumblr post where he just kind says, the Justice League are a team, but Young Justice, they're legitimately a family. Yeah, so they, they are down for, mainly, when I say, I mean, of course, all the teams are like down for each other, but we really see that with the OG six. Yeah. yeah. Or like eight, because at the end of season one, it was eight, but really OG six, <laughs> that they are down for, they are all down for each other, no matter what their past, no matter what their past things are, they're just down, they got their, they, got, they have each other's backs, and they're just down for each other. So like OG six, eight, they're all, I just know that they're going to be down for each other. And I feel like, how the team is now. I mean, I'm sure they, they, help, they all have each other's back, but I feel like the OG team wouldn't have bounced without at least telling everybody first what they're going to be doing. <laughs> yeah, I know I've I've talked, me and Rich, I think have maybe talked about this on the show, but I know I've had lots of conversations with people about how like the Justice League um, is is a job. It is a group of people who have a job, whereas the team for Young Justice is very much a family and is like that teen friendship group that is tight. Like this isn't a job for them. This is their team. This is their family and how that affects the way that the show is able to tell stories. So what do you think stands out about the way Young Justice creates and implements those support systems? Because a lot of shows have ensemble casts and create like, here's our group of characters. They all care about each other. This is how they support each other. But what stands out to you about the way Young Justice does that? I would say maybe like the time skips. stuff Because you see yeah. the time jumps, you see things that happen, you see the effects of it as time goes on, how it really shows what happened before, how it, how it resulted either good or bad. Example for like those support systems with Miss Martian, my all-time favorite character. I love her. I love my Martian girl. You, you give the points like with Welcome to Happy Harbor, you see her happy-go-lucky girl using a power sign to like get her footing on Earth. Her rift. Images. Usual suspects. Yes. Episode season two and then episode, is episode one of season three. So... The main, the main episode where you see that support system come into place is Usual Suspects because both Miss Martian and Armin and Roy have these secrets that they don't want to tell the team because they're afraid of what might happen, especially Miss Martian because you should see as in images, she's afraid of what might happen once they find out that she's a white Martian. Yeah. They might like turn her back on her like she feels like everyone else had back in, back on Mars because she, she said she didn't want to take the chance yeah. to let them know. But once she saw how Superboy and Armist told their told their truths and how they still accepted them. She was like, "Well, guess it's my turn." <laughs> it was my turn, and lo and behold, they they kind of look they were kind of look creeped out. Sans Connor and Calder, who did not back up, who, did, who didn't back up once, because <laughs> Calder has grown up around crazy stuff down in Atlantis, and Superboy already knew they're fine. Yeah. It's fine, but she, they saw how. Oh my gosh, y'all, y'all know who I, y'all see how I really look like, but y'all still are down for me and they, they accept me. And if it wasn't for that, I, for that support she felt from them, I feel like she wouldn't have been, she wouldn't have accepted her mar- true Martian self in season three. And she wouldn't yeah. be, she wouldn't be that white Martian, that beautiful white Martian she is now. Yeah. Yeah. I know Rich and I have talked a lot about that scene in season one, just because it's, 
because it messes with your expectations in the way that you assume support systems work on most shows where you get to this moment and these characters are going to lie or they're not going to say anything. They're just going to go off on their own. Whereas the show not only has them lay it, lay all of that out and lay all of their problems and their struggles out on the team, but has the whole team accept that and move forward and be like, no, we are here to support you. We're not going to freak out beyond, you know, a little bit of shouting Lex Luthor is your dad. And <laughs> what do you mean you're a white Martian? But once like everything's out on the table, everybody's like, okay, we're friends. How do we move forward from here? And I agree with you. I think that is such a strong scene for talking about this. Do you have any other scenes that you want to talk about for that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, another season one, episode one moment, Calder, or should I say Aquaman comes in again as leader of the team. You were invited to observe. Do I want to observe? Probably not, but please come. I believe I can use the, I believe I can use the emotional support or basically support. And McGann's like, you have that Calder always. At the the one at the beginning of season yeah. three when he has the meeting with the team and yeah. Just yeah. <laughs> Just clarifying that I knew exactly what scene we we're talking about. I agree. That is such such a good moment. Because it was the, like that thing that you were talking about before, about how the original six members of the team, especially like the whole team supports each other, but those original six members of Aqualad, Kid Flash, Robin, Superboy, Miss Martian, Artemis are like there for each other. All like we days. start, we started this joint. We are, we got each other's back seven years into the game. <laughs> Absolutely. And that way that even though they're now on separate teams and Aqualad is Aquaman and leading the justice league, they still have that relationship. She's like, no, we're still friends. We still support each other. Whatever you need, we got you. Yeah. And another one will be episode four, season three, private security. The Tana, did that one hour meeting with Dr. Fate each year. Armis was there for her. Yes. So you know Armis was that support system. I don't know when that group had started, but if, if it was if it started between the time he became Dr. Fate and now it had to have been seven maybe seven years. But maybe maybe seven years Armis was there for her as that support system. It's probably and she was probably one of the people I'm sure we get again the other girls too, because Raquel is her like Justice League buddy. So Yeah. They support her during those off-screen moments where she's missing her dad. Or I like to think that maybe they rotate years. <laughs> the Tana ha- I mean, that would be really interesting. Same again had the previous year, or Raquel had the year before, and they just rotate. But I think even the fact that it is Artemis specifically in that scene shows how the show, with the time skips and everything, is able to create these really long-lasting friendships. Because you see Artemis and Zatanna being really close friends in season one and we don't see a lot of that in season two because she's off with the justice league Mm -hmm. but the fact that even season three comes along and you get that scene and of course it's artemis you as a viewer are like of course we didn't see you two interact almost at all in season two but because of just the way that they present it as like this is a thing artemis does and you're like oh yeah no season one they were friends they have their whole halloween girls night where they go fight a super villain and i'm like yeah of course of course it's artemis of course that's the choice that they made because they do they create these support systems and they become that sort of family that we've been talking about yeah and i just thought of another one that's actually a very good one so go for it season one season one episode 24 which i believe is performances wally calls dick during that undercover mission at the circus and he Dolly knows what happened with his parents and all that stuff because they've been they've been friends since before everything all this happened. Yeah. And then you think about that, they they had a little rough patch in season two, season two, and then you go to episode four and season three, where Dick is missing that support system from Wally, so he, he subconsciously wanted Will to come with him to this mission, and Will figured it out at the end when they were fighting Brick at the top of that moving truck, saying that no, I need you to I need somebody to get my head on straight. Yeah. And how, especially with that relationship, you mentioned how in season two, they go through that really rough patch and you see them have that fight. And the only reason that fight matters is because the show has made them so supportive of each other. And you've seen how much those two characters care about each other. They're not just friends. They are family at that point. Because like season one, Kid Flash is the only one that knows Nightwing's real name, knows Robin's real name, I mean. And then just being able to take that 
simple friendship from season one to this thing where seeing the two of them shout at each other is heartbreaking because you know how strong that bond is and how important that bond is for the both of them. Yeah. Um, I think I I learned this thing from Sailor Moon, the original anime, like you fight if you how, how hard you argue is like how really how strong your friendship is. <laughs> or like if you argue a lot that you're you just know you have a strong friendship. So you know that Jake and Wally were like really tight friends by the way they argued with each other. Like, are yeah. you kidding? And then they were good at the end and then episode 20 season two happened and then my heart broke. <laughs> it hurt us all. It hurt us all. But I do want to ask, since we're talking about this, how do you think uh, some of the adult characters like the Justice League play into creating these sort of support systems between the characters like Black Canary or Batman or anything like that? Um, I would say Black Canary because Black Black Canary is essentially with these relationships because one it gives them it gives these characters someone from the adult team to talk to because yeah. not, I'm sure it's Justice League not all of them are like approachable. <laughs> Batman, <laughs> just go to Batman with your with your boy troubles. It's fine. Batman <laughs> will totally sit there and just accept this. Like Black Canary is there to listen, especially that was shown in. The episode after failsafe. Yeah. The traumatizing episode of failsafe. Um, <laughs> I believe it's called Disheart or Disheart or Disordered. Disordered, yeah. yeah. Oh, she was there to talk. And then she shows, she shows that side of her again in Corner in season two, but not as much, but not as much as it was in Disorder. And then she's like, she, she and I believe that kind of like made Miss M want to be that counselor. Season yeah, three. I've been I've been thinking about that for a while now because we have it. We've only gotten like <laughs> we we me and Rich have just recorded our scream something for the first three episodes of season Can't wait three. Wait for that too. Uh, <laughs> but in that in those first three episodes, they mention at one point the fact that uh, both Black Canary and Miss Martian went to Taos to help with all of the metatines there to provide counseling and everything. And seeing the two of them there together kind of made it click in my mind of like, oh, Black Canary definitely had a hand, I think, in making Miss Martian realize this was what she wanted to do with her life. And just getting to see, again, those those awesome little through lines from season one to season three of like how those relationships and those support systems create these big character moments and character decisions. Yeah, and Black Hair was a pivotal person in calming Superboy down. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, I believe Batman, it was a, is a, even though he's not approachable, of course, Dick is, I'm sure he's someone that Dick can go to because he is the main reason why he, Dick doesn't want to try to like Batman because after what happened with his parents, because they're similar to what happened to their parents, so and Bruce wanted to make sure that didn't happen with Dick because uh, he got closure by finding the guy who, respons- who was responsible for what happened to his parents. We're not going to go into detail. Because- <laughs> <laughs> the heart. And I remember in um, downtime, Dick was not feeling good about himself, but like he helped Bruce helped cheer him up. Yeah, that basketball game. So that's a form of that support too. <laughs> yeah. I think I think you're totally right cuz even Batman I know we've we've talked about it on the show before the idea that in the Young Justice universe Greg has Greg Weissman has confirmed that like Dick became Nightwing on his own terms and like it wasn't about punching Batman in the face and walking out and being like no I'm going to do what I want it was about just growing as a person and wanting to strike out on his own as a hero and how the show has created that kind of relationship between those two characters and crafted Batman as a mentor figure that you can kind of believe. Like, he's not the most approachable. He's not Black Canary. You can't sit down and, like, lay all your problems out for Batman. But he's still a surprisingly good dad and is still there, especially for Dick Grayson, but for kind of all of them of being able to be like, I'm not just big, scary Batman. I am a person. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I believe another example is what, of course, began in Beast Boy. Yeah. Their history. That's, that's no, Alan, that's my beautiful sister, Megan. <laughs> I think I remember reading somewhere, and asked Greg, where someone asked if Megan would Megan be afraid to show Gar her true self. 
and she's I think Gar I think Greg said back to me back in season two, maybe, but like now, no. No, no, yeah. I know. I love their relationship. I love getting to see that kind of sibling thing between the two of them. And I think it's even more interesting now, especially because we have seen like uh McGann's Martian brother and how those two relationships are so different and yet so similar at the same time. Oh, I never thought about that. <laughs> I never thought uh, comparing like McGann's relationship with Gar and her at her newer blood brother. <laughs> well, I'm technically Gar is her blood brother now because of the blood transfusion. But... Yeah, it's like adoptive brother, Martian brother. I don't know how to refer to either of them. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, because we do get to see McCollum and we get to see McGann kind of go into that like protective, angry big sister mode when dealing with her brother causing an interplanetary incident on another planet. It's fine. It's fine. But then seeing how much she does care about her brother and seeing like how she interacts with Gar and how she cares about both of them, but in such kind of not different ways, but different approaches to like that care. Weird little Martian family. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And maybe this might be a stretch, but not really. Maybe you see that with Blue, too, because you saw in the beginning of season two, Blue wasn't really comfortable telling everybody the truth of why he seems like he's talking to himself. Yeah. The scarab, yeah. Of course, with Blue Beetle and the Scarab, yeah. Potter finds out first like, because he straight up asks, like, who are you talking to? And Simon's <laughs> like, uh, it's a Scarab. Con- Connor was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> and then, like, later on, after all this stuff happened, I'm sure everybody found, found out that he's talking to the Scarab. And then by season two, everyone's, like, not really looking at him crazy anymore. And I'm sure Impulse was, like, pivotal in that, too, because he, of course, he took a chance to get to know Blue because he was trying to t- keep him away from turning, being on mode. So I'm sure he found out. He's like, oh, okay, cool, whatever. So once time I realized, like, when they found out and they like, oh, and you say they're all like, oh, why didn't you say that? <laughs> yeah, and then we see even all the way into season three the fact that everybody clearly now knows about the scarab and is chill with the scarab <laughs> to yeah. some extent. Chill <laughs> in quotation marks. Don't let him blow up anything. But like nobody is like, what are you doing? What are you talking to? Like as we said, like Tracy, Tracy just immediately knows what's going on, even though he's talking to no one. <laughs> yeah. Um. But one thing that I was, I've just been thinking about all this and mulling this over in my head. And I wanted to return real quick to the scene you were talking about before with, uh, in season three with Miss Martian and Calder at the very beginning of season three and how I think one of the things that is so interesting about Young Justice and these support systems that you've been talking about is the fact that you're able to put two characters from this team that we've never seen have like a really strong relationship before but we still absolutely believe them as caring that deeply about each other and wanting to support each other like that like because when i think of miss martian's strong relationships calder is not in like the top five like calder is relatively low on that list of like he's in the top 10 but he's not like one of her like closest friends he's not connor and he's not her brother and he's not artemis but the fact that you are able, they are able to write that conversation between them and have all of us go, no, of course, of course they support each other like that just I think speaks to how strong the writing on the show is when it comes to like these inter-team dynamics. Yeah, yeah. And I remember back in the episode Denial, season one, episode seven. Yeah. Gan mentioned that Calder is like a big brother to her. Yeah. So, of course, you don't see it, but you, I used to see that you don't really see it throughout the show af- afterwards because they don't have like scenes together like she like she has with Superboy and Artemis yeah. or um Wally mainly Superboy and Artemis but um <laughs> <laughs> and no and Dick and Dick I forgot because they have a se- her and Dick have a scene in in season two episode yeah. seventeen and I think it's that similar it has that similar kind of tone to it where you're like oh I never really paused to think of how like. Dick and McGann interact with each other but then the second that they show us that I completely believe it because I'm like yeah of of course you all care about each other this much and like I think the tie-in comics kind of help with that I know you said you've been starting to read those and everything there like there are conversations between Calder and McGann and those and stuff like that that I think even cements that even more of going like oh you do have this really strong relationship we just don't always see it on the show because there's so many characters. Yeah, yeah. 
like you saw it the most in season one because it was mainly just those core six, but you added like at Satana, Roy, or should I say Will now, and Raquel. <laughs> so, um, you see them mostly in season one. But then season two comes, you don't see it as much because you have the new characters like OMB, Mal, Batgirl, Tim, Beast Boy, Wonder Girl. Did I say Wonder Girl already? <laughs> There's multiple Wonder Girls out there in the world. It's okay. True, true, true. Plus, you don't know what happened between that five year gap. Yeah. And you don't, want, you don't know what happened between the two year gap. So in season three, we have 13, Arrowette, spoiler. We have the Runaways in season two, we have Arsenal. The League, The Reach, Pearl Tennis. Just everyone, The Light, everyone. So There's so many characters to keep track of. But I do think that you're absolutely right that creating this kind of sense of family between like just the general idea of the team makes all of those characters a little easier to accept because you're just like, everybody here has got each other's backs. So yeah. once you know that, you're like, okay, I can keep up with who everyone is as long as I know some basic basic facts about the team in general <laughs> oh yeah yeah and also a little another example of like the runaways in season two yeah. during their episodes they can tell they were their own support system for all their stuff because they were the ones that got their in the, that got conjured by the reach the longest they're the yeah. ones that got the meta powers they're the ones that had to deal with being guinea pigs at star they're the ones that ran away had each other's backs for how long they were with either on their own or with legs before the reach thing had at the end and they all split up this yeah. guy, I was so, kind of peeved. I was during I was 16. I was like, where are Ty and Asami? I need this reunion to be complete. We have Ed, we have Virgil. Where are Ty and Asami? I I'm I'm curious to find out if they'll if they'll show up later. Because we don't know. Maybe they they're like maybe they're not being superheroes. We don't know where they're at. Maybe they didn't want to intrude on the little little team meetup. So I mean, it wasn't really a meetup. It was like a carnival that Ed, Ed, like, ran true, at the true. It apparently it started like the day was supposed to be team bonding day, and then it just kind of fell apart on being team bonding day. Yeah, <laughs> according to Static. Yeah, who 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 also Static needs a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag get get Virgil a girlfriend twenty nineteen. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I- I can't wait to watch Scream something because I'm, I'm gonna make that for episode 16 with y'all. But that's Scream something session. <laughs> we had we have a lot. We had a lot to talk about. And then we gotta wait for the individual episode. Uh, by the time this comes out, people will have already heard it and will have already heard all of our screaming. But uh, at the time that we're recording this, no one's heard it yet. Nobody nobody knows all of the things we have to say. Oh yeah, yeah. And then who knows what you're gonna say when you start to so, do the episode individually? <laughs> <laughs> so much. Uh, always so much. But. Uh, with the support system, I did want to talk. Why do you think it's so important for a show like Young Justice specifically, or shows in general, stories in general, to create these kind of support systems between characters? Like, what do you think it adds to the show, not just to the characters? It adds to the show. It makes like the show magical because, like, in order for like a, in order for someone to really like a show, you really have to like the characters in it. You have to really yeah. care about the characters and. In order to care about the characters, you need to learn about their struggles and like the struggles they go with the, they go through with each other. Because how we talk about how that team is a family, we really believe that they're a family by just watching what we see. So, yeah. Michelle has all these characters, and they do that. I'm sure it is possible for a show for a show to have all these characters, and for us not to believe that they're a family, even though they say it, say it they are because of how we see them, how they're portrayed in the show. Like another reason why Team Time, the original Team Time show was so magical because they, throughout the all, all five seasons, they had each other's backs. <laughs> they are another prime example of a support system. Season four, where Raymond went all that stuff with her dad. Season three, where Sour went through that little tip with Robin, but when he needed help, they came for him. <laughs> against season, like when they were against the mind control Titans East. Season two would tear, oh my God. So much from Teen Titans, so much from the original Teen Titans. But I think, for me at least, one of the things that really sets like Teen Titans and Young Justice apart in that way that is connected to all this is the fact that like Teen Titans, despite all of like the awesome emotional work that they did and everything, was very focused on them 
being superheroes. Like, we never hear anybody's real name on Teen Titans, if I remember correctly. They are always Raven, Cyborg, Starfire, all that. Whereas Young Justice goes out of its way to be like, yes, they're superheroes, but they're also just teenagers. And here's them just being teenagers and just hanging out as normal teenagers. And their shenanigans. Yes. <laughs> um, and just showing how, like, that makes those support systems and those relationships like even stronger. Cause I do think Teen Titans did a lot of awesome emotional work with some of those episodes of like, you mentioned Raven and all of her stuff with her dad, which is really emotional storytelling right there. But young justice can like take it, take it that one step further to be like, yes, all of the superhero stuff is fantastic. All of this is super high energy and super intense, but sometimes you got to take that step back and go, this is just, a group of kids who care about each other, which I think really informs just the way that the show tells stories so well. Sorry, I'm just going to ramble. <laughs> oh, no, it's fine. It's fine. I love it. I ramble. You ramble. It's in, in, in form, rambling. From I think form. you mentioned uh, how like people watch TV for characters. Like you got to, you got to care about characters to return to a TV show. And I do think that's something that's so unique to both TV and comics, especially those two mediums and how Young Justice is that overlap between both of them of like serialized storytelling like that. You got to make people care about your characters. Like having a good plot is important or having a good theme is important. But if I don't care about the characters on a show, like it doesn't matter how good the plot is or how interesting the mystery is if I'm not invested in the people. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, why am I? Why am I watching the show? I don't care. I don't care for who's on my screen right now. <laughs> yeah. So I think Young Justice does that fantastically well of finding that way to balance both having like these super cool mysteries and intricate plots with characters that you're invested in. And I think a big part of that is what we've been talking about of creating these really strong, big relationships where it's not just like caring about one romance or one friendship. It's you care about everybody collectively interacting yeah. with each other yeah well, this this conversation just made me think of another example of art with Artemis. go for how, it and how the aftermath of what happened in season two she ends up moving in with will and you had you had a friend of mine i met i i met like um the tumblr when season one when season three part one was airing ariel horn you had her on your show yes so you had her on her show. we loved having i loved talking to ariel she's awesome she's awesome she is a big fan of Jade and she's writing a story about like how Armin ended up living with Roy with Will and Ro- Will and Jade and Leon. Um, it's yeah. just it's some process, but like maybe maybe there was a chance that Jade did live with them before she whatever happened happened where she had to leave. I could see that. I believe that and their support system that she had wasn't with her sister in her family. Yeah. So I'm sure even though they're on different sides of like the, you, you can tell that they love each other dearly. Absolutely. They will, like how you say, they're not going to like turn each other in. I just like, you mentioned armor, let them walk out. In episode <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not going to turn you in, girl. <laughs> Come on. But go see your kid. <laughs> she has it. her priorities straight. I will let the villain walk away, but she needs to go see her daughter. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure maybe Jade did, did, kind of want Armas to move in with move in with her and them to like help her rebuild after what happened with Wally. Like as her mother said in the sixteen, it took her like two years to rebuild. <laughs> Ouch my heart again. But um Yeah, so that's another example with her Armas and her like sisters and her family like Will and Leon. Will and Armas better not happen, but um <laughs> because I will throw my laptop and phone and or phone out the window. Not really, but I will but like that's a, that's a support I, system I can her. feel you there we we me and rich had a very very long conversation that people have probably already heard in our scream something about that whole possibility but yeah i think i think i really like the idea you were mentioning of like the idea that artemis probably was living with jade for a while there of and how the show is able to create that support system of even though they're on separate sides they have that strong sisterly relationship that makes you go oh of course of course this is where artemis is at and all of that and how like even though uh red arrow not roy (laughs) red arrow and artemis have that like conflict in season one where they really don't like each other by the time you get to season three you see them oh that's family 
Yes. They were like button heads as a woman. Now they're living with each other and possibly nope. Hopefully not, nope. but um because I will throw up in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> possibly nope. Yeah. So like that story of Ariel's, I believe it's called, and they, then they were roommates. Maybe <laughs> that actually did happen in the show. Wait, wait no, what? Uh. No, the story's called and then and then they were roommates. How Jay wanted Armis to move in with her after the stuff that happened with Wally. Yeah. So maybe out maybe that actually did happen in between the in the two year time time jump. You never know. Yeah. Hopefully it did. You <laughs> never know. Actually, maybe we'll find out. We still do have half a season. And hopefully a season four. <laughs> like people are listening to this and they're like, Well, why didn't why didn't they just know about XYZ? We still have half a season. <laughs> Yeah. waiting for us and hopefully but, season four and more time comic to explain more stuff hopefully fingers and crossed fingers crossed when they got into the universe oh another thing about Trace 13 I like to believe she's also a troll too because <laughs> when they got back to um house to stop Queen Bees and force them and taking them after she did the bad luck powers on the male Terra twin to get the thing down, she started laughing. So I want to know. She's probably like a troll in that sense, like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> like, ha, ha. She's just mischievous. She's just, she wants to just mess with stuff. I'm like, if you have bad luck powers, all of, all of your superpower stuff is just kind of like vaguely mischievous messing with people. Yeah. And also, okay, I remember the thing I want to talk about. I like the, yeah. I think I got this idea from either a YouTube comment or something on Reddit. It'd be so funny if the scarab is jealous <laughs> I mean, because kind of the tension is going on her because like after she, after she. I totally think he is a little bit actually. Like you mentioned that. I, I can absolutely see that. <laughs> yeah, Cause after she like, he wanted to blow up, blow up the air, blow up the um, classic scarab. He wanted to blow up the helicopter. I was like, no, we want to save her to not like blow her up. And then Trace is like, you know, maybe I can bring her down with that injury. Doop, doop, doop. Bad luck that goes down because of the oil leak. That should do it. And he's like, I could have done something like that too. Yada, yada, yada. Who wants the destruction? Yeah. And I was like, dude, really? No, I absolutely agree. I definitely think Scarab is kind of just like, what are you doing? Why, why are you letting her be around? What is happening? <laughs> This isn't good. Like, Scarab's like kind of in his head sometimes. He's like, uh, dude, dude, what? You don't, we need to focus on the mission. You don't get to just go have a girlfriend. <laughs> oh, if they explore that idea more in the show, I'm going to laugh. We'll have to, we'll have to wait and see. I would love, I would love to see more of Tracy. I would love to see more of that whole team. And, you know, we might. They're they're stepping out, going and doing some more public heroing. Who knows what'll be happening with Blue Beetle and and Tracy now on slightly different teams for the rest of the season. We'll see how that goes down. Yeah, like yeah. Hopefully Hopefully it's good. <laughs> hopefully. hopefully. Fingers crossed always. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm like, because <laughs> Because of everything we've been talking about, I mean, like, we've seen characters go off on different teams before, and it doesn't stop them from having strong relationships with everybody they were friends with before, so I don't think there's any reason to worry. Yeah. Uh, unless unless you're Tim dealing with Wonder Girl. Yeah, yeah, Jaime's secrets. not. Secrets. Jaime's the person that will tell, I feel like Jaime's the person that will tell someone up front, oh, oh, I think I'm going to do this, yada, 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 like, okay, cool, thanks for, tell- thanks for letting me know. You don't think Jaime would just like walk out with Batman and be like, bye, going on my own team now. <laughs> he's not about that life. I don't think Jaime's not about that life. <laughs> he's a sense, he's a very sensible guy. He's a family oriented guy. He loves his family. He loves his friends. Family's not always by blood. He loves his friends, Brenda and Paco from the Blue Beetle comic book series, his family, Milagro, his little sister, his mom, his dad. He, he got, he, an interesting fact, in his, in the original Blue Beetle, Run the first one for Infinite Crisis. He got some type of money from Batman from like working with them in space because <laughs> when he first got the scarab, he ends up in space for he thought it was in t- for ten minutes, but really he was gone for a year. So his family and friends were like, "Where did you go <laughs> in that year span?" And then I think he somehow he got like money, and during that year span, his dad had to like sell his like auto shop because he had you know like auto mechanic shop. Couldn't really pay for it because yeah. things happened. So he used that money that Batman gave him to buy his shop, his dad's shop back. Oh, he's a very sensitive family guy. So, I'm a good kid. 
<laughs> so I, I would be surprised if he pulled a Tim on Tracy. I would be like, dude. No, Tracy. Tracy was around when this decision was made. Ever, I think they're fine. I th- I was jo- I was joking. I think they're totally fine, and I can't wait to see both of them in the rest of this season. I hope I get Tracy thirteen episode with her and Zatanna. Oh, that would be so cool. I I would I would absolutely love to see that magical girl team up. That would be fantastic. And I'd love to see how maybe some of Zatanna's mannerisms would rub off on her. <laughs> Because I think I forget where I read it, but I feel like somewhere they uh, they've talked about how like Zatanna is Tracy's like mentor, like her specific mentor yeah, yeah. on the t- on yeah. the league. Tracy said that in episode five, where she's like, "I think I can help," and Sag's like, "Are you sure?" Zatanna's been teaching me focus. Like, oh, there we go. Yes, I love it. I love that idea. Just Zatanna taking all the magic kids under her wing. Just be like, "Let me help you, child." Yeah. Don't go to Doctor Fate. Go to me. I'm more approachable. Yeah. Also, I, I kind of like see a little bit myself in Tracy because she's goofy. I'm goofy. It's always, always wonderful to find characters that you can relate to. Yeah. I also want to see before the season start. I want to hope I see like another girl team up episode like we did season five of Beneath with like Arrowhead, Spoiler Tracy, and Winter Girl. But then Arrowhead and Spoiler Brown. So I was like, well, that idea shot. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe we could still we could still get a nice all girl team up. We'll see. We again. I feel like half of this is just being like, I guess we'll just wait and see for the rest of the season because yeah. we just have no idea. I would I would love to see all of the girls team up again because the show has fantastic female characters and I do like seeing them all get to go out and kick butt together. It's fantastic. We've had a couple of those over the years and I just I love all of them. <laughs> They're all fun. Yeah, oh, I can't wait to rest for the rest of July and then August. They'll be over. <laughs> season four. Season four needs to be in the world. Hopefully, come on, Comic Con. Fingers crossed. We are all hoping for a season four announcement coming soon. But on that note, I think it is time for us to start wrapping up and yeah, heading I'm out. Joking, I'm yeah. We got it. all good things must come to an end. <laughs> no worries. No worries. But. Thank you so much for spending some time with us in the Watchtower, Taylor. So where can people find you here on Earth Prime? So you can find me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is TaylorAnn112. And I am Miss Martian 369 on Tumblr. And that's also my fan fiction name. If you want to check out my story, the team and their shenanigans, where I kind of write about the team doing stuff off mission. They're doing like shenanigans type stuff. But one example, they go to like a sushi restaurant in Metropolis, was, and Bart eats like a big wobble, was, big wobble wasabi. He thinks it's spicy mustard. <laughs> I got that from that. I got the idea from an episode of The Nanny where they're eating sushi. DC tells tells Fran, "Oh no, this is um wasabi. It's like spicy mustard." So she's like, "Oh, I love mustard." She takes a big wobble of it, and then you know wasabi has that kick to it. So she's like flailing around, like, and then eventually falls out of her chair. I had Bart do the same thing, and Cass is like, "Bart." What are you doing? Get up right now! You are embarrassing us. Get up right now! <laughs> and stuff like that. I'm currently running like three different chapters. It will be up. It was. It will be up eventually. Like I just, I, I realized that with fan fiction, there's like times where you like, yeah, let's write this. And you're good, but then there's like afterwards, you have like, you go through like a day or a week. You just don't feel like writing. Yeah, <laughs> that happens to all of us. But thank you for joining us today and thanks to everyone else for spending some time with us if you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series you can find us on twitter at the yj files on facebook at crashing the mode on tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com and on our website crashing the mode.com you can also find us on youtube stitcher iHeartRadio, spotify and if that isn't enough you can also email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., because we have to look a little harder to find those. So maybe try to make our jobs just a little bit easier. And if you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron on patreon.com slash crashing the mode. 
Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and so much more. And as always, stay well, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.